Thank you very much, Bruce. Well, I came to, since I, I, I will tell you about our journey from, from searching biomarkers to brain therapies. When I came, I came to the, I, to the Institute of Psychiatry and to, to work in a department 23 years ago, and just want to start with a little anecdote. When I came to work here, my mentor, which was an adult psychiatrist at the famous Kreplin Institute of Psychiatry in Munich, after which the, the Munch lecture was modeled, he said to me that ADHD doesn't really exist. So far from not existing, uh, ADHD is the most imaged childhood disorder, and we have found in our search for, for imaging structure and function, substantial abnormalities. These children have a delay in brain maturation. In functional MRI, they have complex abnormalities in several networks, like Edmund already mentioned. They have abnormalities in frontal striatal networks, which are important for executive functions. They have abnormalities in frontal limbic uh, networks for reward processing. They also have problems with switching off their default mode network, which reflects mind wandering, and both not being able to switch off your mind wandering and not being able to, and let, being less able to switch on task relevant regions, leads to poor cognition in the disorder. And like Edmund already mentioned, there are many, there is heterogeneity, and some children are more impaired in some networks or others. Now, several frontal regions have been implicated in ADHD within these networks. One region we have consistently found to be underactivated uh, compared to healthy controls is the inferior frontal cortex. Uh, we have found this in numerous individual studies, but also in our latest meta-analysis, the last one included more than 600 ADHD patients. This area is very interesting because it's not just important for self-control, it's also important for sustaining attention, it's important for timing, which are all those functions which are impaired in ADHD. We've also found this area to be uh, disorder specifically reduced compared to other childhood disorders like autism or OCD. Furthermore, we found that this area is also the area, the very same area, which is con most consistently upregulated with stimulant medication which is, of course, the gold standard treatment. So we thought if this uh, area is a consistent abnormality, the most replicated abnormality in ADHD, and it is underlying the mechanism of action of stimuli medication, it would be a good target for, for neurotherapies because we can mimic the stimulant effect, but without the side effects. Now, going back a step, why do we need neurotherapies? We have a very good drug. Stimuli medication is one of the best drugs in psychiatry. 50% of patients with ADHD improve quite, uh, quite uh, satisfactorily. However, there is, of course, the other 50%. There are side effects. And most importantly, the latest studies, the longitudinal studies, have shown that the effect dissipates over the years. And we have shown that based on PET studies, the brain adapts to the drug. And of course, the brain adapts to most drugs I, I know of, and, and this is not surprising. But if the brain develops a tolerance, then of course, it's logical that the medication is not going to work forever. So therefore, brain-based therapies which target those key brain abnormalities in ADHD, which have no side effects and which have longer-term neuroplastic effects, are very promising uh, or could be very promising. So there are two ways how we can modify uh, brain regions, in this case uh, the infrafrontal cortex, which lies deep in the brain, we can use neurofeedback where we train children to self upregulate these regions with neurofeedback, or we can stimulate this region with electrical brain stimulation. When we can combine this with cognitive training, which also stimulates this area, and we have a sort of double whammy effect. So, I will talk more about these two therapies which we're using in our lab at the moment. So fMRI neurofeedback is based on operant conditioning. The child, the, the activity of the child is connected to computer game in an MRI scanner. And the child, instead of using this button box to play a video game, he has to use his brain to play the video game. So he has to enhance the activity of a, a region, in this case the infrafrontal cortex, which is directly connected to the video game. In this case, we have a rocketeer flying up into the sky, and the child has to uh, fly the rocketeer up with his brain activity. Of course, the child doesn't know how to do that, so he uses trial and error. But every time he does something with this activity and he notices the rocketeer flies, he learns. And this is called the neurofeedback loop, or the brain-computer interface. 
So healthy adults can do this in 30 minutes. But we, uh, when we did the study, there was no study in children, and we had no idea whether children can do it, and we had also no idea whether children who already we know have poor self-regulation can actually regulate their brain. So we had to do a proof of concept study, and we did a small study in 31 ADHD adolescents, and one group had to enhance the infrafrontal cortex, and we had an active control group of a group who had to enhance another area. Uh, this region here. And what they had to do is play this computer game with activity. We had a rocket in our previous one, but in our current study we have this rather cool rocket here, which they have to move up and they have to reach a space station at the end of the game. So what we found in neurofeedback effects, we found in fact ADHD children are able to self-regulate their brain activity. So this is the active group who managed to enhance progressively over 11 runs of about eight minutes. So this was over four MRI scans. They managed to enhance the right infrafrontal activity. And they, it took them about an hour. So they took twice as long as healthy adults, but they could learn. When we looked at the behavioral effects, we found that both groups improved. But remember, we had two active groups. So the control group also managed to enhance their region. And both groups improve in clinical symptoms with a medium effect size. What was most interesting is that almost a year later, when we measured them again, the active group had a very large improvement of 26% a symptom reduction with an effect size of one, while the control group only had a trend level effect with half the effect size. So this is similar effect size as we see in, in stimular medication compared to placebo. What is interesting is, of course, the longer-term effectiveness because it would suggest there is a longer-term consolidation effect and it, it is in line with the notion that neurofeedback has longer-term neuroplastic effects, which is what drugs cannot offer. Uh, this effect has, by the way, also been shown with EG neurofeedback, this protracted effect that it seems to work even better sometime after than immediately after the training. When we look at the stop task uh, in fMRI, where children with ADHD typically have reduced infrafrontal activation, we found that after the training, the active group had enhanced activation of the infrafrontal cortex after the treatment compared to before the treatment. And this is the same as, as I've shown you what methylphenidate does. It also enhances this region doing an inhibition task. So methylphenidate and, and neurofeedback both can enhance the activity of this area but of course, neurofeedback had no side effects. So in conclusion, does fMRI work in ADHD? It is feasible, ADHD children can do this. It is associated with symptom reduction. Uh, uh, we found better attention in the active group with a large effect size. We found better inhibitory brain activation, and it was safe. So we thought the findings are promising, but of course, we need to replicate this in a larger group and we need to, to include the sham condition to rule out placebo effects. So therefore, we are now very lucky and, and got funding from the MSC for a larger study where we, we include 100 ADHD children and we include a placebo condition. <laughs> so with respect to brain stimulation, what we're using is transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a non-invasive brain stimulation technique, which is much less painful than TMS. It's actually not painful. It's very cheap has no side effects, and what it consists in applying a very uh, simple electric current to the brain, and the R node of the electrical uh, current has shown to enhance underlying brain activation, and the cathode decreases the excitability of underlying neurons. It has also been shown if you combine electrical stimulation with, with a computer game, you potentiate the effect of both of them because the computer game will also stimulate this area, and then if you, in addition, stimulate this region with electric stimulation, you have a double whammy effect. This method is very interesting because there's evidence for longer-term neuroplastic effects, which is what we are after. So the, in ADHD, there is already some evidence. There have been nine studies who have looked at one of five sessions of uh, TDCS, and two studies looked at clinical improvements. They found clinical improvements of attention in adults and in children. All the other studies looked 
but mostly at cognitive improvements and they found also cognitive improvements of inhibition or attention or working memory. But no study has actually tested more than five sessions and no study has combined brain uh, stimulation with cognitive training which has shown in others to be far more potent than each method alone. So this is what we're doing in our study currently. We're combining TDCS with cognitive training and some engaging computer games which are developed by Yale University by some colleagues. And we're expecting a synergistic effect because training of working memory, attention and inhibition will also target this region and then the simulation will potentiate the effect. We furthermore, uh, mm -hmm, thank you. <laughs> we furthermore um, will test exactly the same uh, cognitive functions, um, clinical symptoms, and we also will look at longer term effects as in the other study to see which method has better uh, effect on improving clinical symptoms, cognition, and which method has the longer or the better long term effects. Now, so in conclusion, Brain therapies for ADHD, I think, are very promising, and we have good targets based on neuroimaging uh, of ADHD. They have, they are very promising because they have a potential for longer term neuroplastic effects. However, these methods are very much in their childhood and they need further investigation. There is some evidence if you stimulate some regions, you may actually down stimulate neighboring regions or regions in the other side of the hemisphere because of interhemispheric inhibition. So this is something one needs to worry about if you stimulate the right if the frontal cortex, for example, do be then damaged the dorsal the prefrontal cortex or other regions, and that would impair other functions. We don't know about brain saturation effects. There is some evidence there may be a plateau based on neurofeedback studies. It has also been shown that with brain stimulation, if you stimulate too high, you may actually achieve the opposite effect. You, you may achieve a down regulation. So no one knows about optimal dose. This is all unknown. Um, frequency, how often do you need to stimulate? How many sessions do you need for neurofeedback? We don't know enough about the short term and the longer term effects. Uh, we don't know how long are the neuroplastic effects. Studies have only tested so far up to one year, and there seem to be longer term effects, but we don't know anything about anything longer than that. Uh, and even in ADHD, we don't know uh, much about long term effects. Uh, what happens after two years, three years? Do you need to top up? These are all unknowns. What about individualized treatment? Which children will benefit from neurofeedback or from, from brain stimulation or medication? There may be different children who benefit, obviously, from different treatments. And we know that some children don't learn neurofeedback. We also don't know which regions should be target networks. We could use uh, pattern recognition analysis to target the networks which are impaired in each individual patient, which may be more effective than just target a region which has been found based on group statistics. So there are a lot of questions and a lot of unknowns and I leave you with those questions and I thank all the colleagues who have been involved in the studies, the funders, the patients and I thank you for sustaining attention.